Hello, I'm Vic Rabbiting from ISO and I'm here at the Photographer Academy and we're going to go through the colour managed workflow. Right at a top level so you can just get a good understanding of how the process works and the steps required to go in. We're not going to dive into massive detail here, just talk about it um, from a contextual level, give you a good idea. First question though, and I do this as a seminar often, and I always ask this question first is, where do you start? You've just got a new assignment from a, a photographer or, um, or as a photographer from say another client, or maybe you're an amateur, please don't say just, and you're going out to take some pictures to win an award at your local club. Both significant challenges for you. So where do you start? You, know, you can think about picking cameras or maybe lights or what lens you're going to do. No, that's not where the beginning starts. The beginning is, what am I going to deliver? What do I want to have to offer at the end of this little project? So if you're going out, say, to, to photograph a landscape uh, or some street photography, what are you going to deliver at the end of it? How are you going to present that? You're going to have a 60-inch print, a 90-inch print, or maybe they're just going to go in a book or on a website. Choose your equipment and the process based on where your material is going to go. It's even more important if you're a professional. If they're telling you, the customer that is, that they want the pictures to be used, you know, the size of a building or just in a brochure, you can balance those requirements to how you deliver the pictures. Very, very important to think about what you want to deliver before you start. Right, second step. Second step, obviously, is you go out and you take the pictures. Especially if you're shooting commercially, but if you're not shooting commercially and you're just doing that landscape, it's always good to have a reference point. And you've probably seen these and thought, some of you may know what they are, but thought, well, what are these devices for and why are they so expensive and what do I do with them? Well, I'm not going to get in great detail here. Don't turn off now. Listen, because this is going to help. This is a colour checker and it allows you to see the colours that uh, the camera is seeing. It has a flaw to it and I'll explain what that is in a minute. So this is the data colour version and this is the X-ray version. And I'm going to show you the data colour one because actually I quite like the size of it. It's quite good. Um, you'd use this to match the colours to the process all the way through. So when you photograph something, so let's say you were photographing some fashion and my fashionably grey shirt here. If you photograph my fashionably grey shirt, you could tell then where the grey was on that colour checker and also balance it to my skin tones. And you can profile the camera so you can understand how the camera is seeing the current light coming off the lights we've got running here to your photograph. Now, that's good, especially if you've got a process running through where you need accurate colour at the end that needs to represent the colour of the garment. Where it breaks is if you were shooting a sunset, for example, and you held this up and you caught the light of the sun on this and you clicked on it when your photograph is, what you'd end up with is not a beautiful sunset, but the light would look like midday. That's not why you photograph a sunset. You want that beautiful warm light. What this is trying to do is make it all neutral, and that's not what you want. But if you were photographing a fashion shoot in the sunset, what you might do is take a picture of the model with their clothes on with that, so you can get the clothes right, layer that part, and then let the sunset work in the background. Of course, you could be lazier or simpler and just flash the model with the background. It has the same effect, but you still need to do this because the flash has a colour that might be different to the current daylight. So that's what these are for. They allow you to create a colour profile, they allow you to do a grey card check, um, <clears throat> and in another video on the site you can see one of my pictures where I forgot to do this and the colour's all slightly wacky. It's a very good tool to have and hopefully you will understand. Um, so that's the colour checkers, very useful devices. Now, once you've shot that and you then decide to ingest your 
files, import them. And I've got Lightroom set up here. In that process, you can create a colour profile for the camera using that, and you can adjust the pictures according to that. Um, that's a topic for another video. I'm not going to go into that right now. But here, what I've done is I've picked three pictures I've done in the past, and I think even, even from where you are now looking at this, you can see one of them actually looks a very weird colour there before we import it. Uh, this one is black and white, uh, and this one looks uh, reasonably correct. Um, this one's black and white because the camera was set to save black and white previews. It's just my odd way of working. Don't worry about it. So let's go and import these three files. They're all raw. Uh, they're shot, uh, I think, with slightly different cameras, but the camera doesn't matter here. Once you've got the raw file and you've matched it correctly, you're able to see exactly how the pictures work. So it's a e simple process, and I'm sure you've all done it, and we've imported the, the colour there. And I'm going to uh, enlarge those. You can have a quick look there. You can see that's a fairly good picture. The colour was accurate when I shot it. Uh, the action is good. The exposure is reasonable. Nothing wrong with that one at all. This one, on the other hand, well, because I've imported a DNG, it's lost all that green hue, which is what the original picture looked like, um, and we've balanced the colour. But this picture actually is very important for you to have a look at carefully, because what's white? Where would we take our white point from if we didn't do a grey card on this, which I didn't do because it's a bit difficult with street photography to go. Excuse me, so I'm just going to photograph you. I'm going to do a grey card in front of you. They kind of get upset with you. So I took the white from here, but I did it for a particular reason because my subject is this guy and we've taken the subject there and we've now got good skin tone because we've got a reasonable white point to reference off. If that hadn't been there, I'd have waited till he'd moved and gone back and got it. So you can see the white point from there where it says redding, uh, which has given us good tonal quality on the skin, which is actually also where I took the exposure from. But now as we go through uh, the photograph, you can see the spillage of, of the light out of the train here onto the snow and then up there you've got the colours of the fluorescent lights in the windows and you could count the the different colours of white here one two three four five six seven eight I mean, I'm, that's too many already and forgetting the colour of the lights there on the station what is white you think snow was white but there isn't a reference point you can take there for white and if i clicked on the one of those, the picture would go very strange. That's where the colour checker, if this was a, a commercial shoot or if you were shooting it maybe for not for fun but for a, a serious use, you might wait till this chap has gone and then shoot another shot which you could do the white balance on later. <clears throat> Good example of how the workflow uh, can affect how you process the picture. And the final one an interesting shot. Why did I bring this one in for you? Well, because it looks ever so simple, but it would be ever so simple to get the colour wrong. And what you probably don't appreciate, and, and without looking at the picture, and there was a reason I decided to make this one black and white, Carl Winders are green. To my eye here, he looks a bit ill, and it's very difficult for me to get the colour of him correct, unless I could get one of those colour checkers behind the window of a BMW. Um, but sitting on a car in a traffic jam on the M4, it made a good picture. Now let's think about output, what you deliver. There's been a creative process from you importing it to what you output, and how you do that, that's your choice. I'm not going to say a word. You do a fantastic job at that. But when you get to the point when you want to deliver a print, um, you need to make sure that the print is the way you want it to look. That doesn't mean that the print is going to be exactly how it looks um, in your original. But we can get the print to look how it looks here on the screen. So let me go back into Lightroom as standard and we'll go into the develop mode here and do that with the mouse. We click in develop 
Um, I'll get rid of that sidebar there. Got away with you, right. Down the bottom here, we've got a setting here called soft proofing. And if we tick on that soft proofing setting, we now see the outline outside goes white. Um, and we can go and check on this item here, which is marked YY. And this gives us two versions of the picture. One's marked current and one's marked proof preview. Go back up here with the zoom and let's zoom in so we can get a, a reasonable view of the, the guy there. And we're at one to one. So you, you're, you can see all the noise in my picture there. Uh, but we've got his face and a little bit of the redding there. Now, if we go over this side here, this particular vert side of it, which is showing us what the print will produce, uh, is sitting in Adobe RGB. Um, and if I click on Other, I load up a whole list of, and, and you shouldn't have this many, ICC profiles. And if you send your pictures away, you can get these ICC profiles. So Loxley, for example, you can download one for Loxley. Um, or if you print yourself, you should have one of these that matches your printer, the inks you're using, and what the professionals call substrate, but the paper that you're printing onto. Or maybe it's canvas. Speaking of canvas, let's go and find a canvas here, because uh, and you can see I've got way too many here. But when I find a nice canvas here, you'll see the effect it's got. There we go, canvas matte with a Canon printer in particular. Even directly through the lens of that camera on the video, you're going to see that one is looking much, much flatter than that one. And that's soft proofing for you. So it's giving you a, a good impression of how the final print will work. Colours are the same. Look, this has lost its richness and it's gone lighter. The green doesn't quite have the that you'd expect. The print output is not going to be the same. Then the question you need to ask is not actually a, an accuracy one first, is a creative one. Where do I want this picture to be? Because I, that's where I got to. Where do I want this picture to be is to be the good representation of the output of that one when I hit the print button. This will save you a lot of money understanding how the print comes out on the final piece of paper than it would if you're messing about, keep printing to see how the, the pictures look. Imagine each sheet of paper costs 20 pounds doesn't take long to actually have quite a bit of money sitting in the corner with bad prints. And you might think, oh, you're ridiculous, Victor. It doesn't cost 20 pounds of print. Don't do the math. It's probably more. Add your time into it. It's going to get even worse. Here, with soft proofing, you get an idea exactly how the pitch is going to look. There's a caveat in that, though. The monitor here is showing you exactly how that picture is looking, because the monitor understands the color space of this, and Adobe software has adjusted this to match the monitor output. Not a filter showing you exactly how the print will come out. No surprises. Very briefly, very succinctly, that's taking you through a color managed workflow, beginning to end, with the monitor set in the Adobe RGB color space, so you've matched the Adobe RGB profile all the way through, to the point when you got to the output where it matches the printer. This one still matches Adobe RGB. I hope that's been helpful. And uh, we'll watch the commentary and maybe we'll go into more depth on some of these topics if that proves to be useful to you. Thank you very much.